you think people are naturally good? No. There's no naturally good. <laughs> no way. You have to learn to be good. If naturally good, North Korea couldn't exist. The predominant view in every college in America is human beings are naturally good. <laughs> really? Yes. Wow. In fact, we had a group of students, and even our conservative kids, half of them think human beings are naturally good. We're capable of being good if we get no, trained. We think naturally. Na that's false. No, humans are naturally very evil. No, I totally agree. Yeah, humans are very naturally evil. Yeah, if people were naturally good, then they would say, wait, stop. Let's not have eight, nine year olds as sex slaves. Right. Yeah. No, humans are. Yeah, that's the thing. Human, I can be totally bad, you know, if I did we not come to America. Everybody capable of being. Well, I think that's what we naturally are. Is mankind naturally good or is he naturally evil? It's a question that's raised in our culture, but I want you to understand it's also a question that the scripture addresses. And I, I think it's a very important question to get right because how you answer that question will shape your worldview. It will shape the way that you approach the Word of God. That clip was an interview with uh, Yeonmi Park, a defector from North Korea. And after seeing the, the horrors perpetuated by the government there in North Korea, she says exactly what the Word of God says, that mankind is naturally evil. Remember Romans chapter 3, uh, Paul quotes the psalmist when he declares, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Those verses in Romans chapter 3 support the biblical doctrine of total depravity. The, the understanding that human nature is, is, is thoroughly corrupt and sinful as a result of the fall. Scripture makes it clear that man is born sinful and therefore must be born again by the Spirit of God. But understand this, our postmodern culture says something very different. Our culture today does a good job of convincing man that he's just fine how he is, right? And so in place of biblical conviction, there is this incoherent teaching that, that what is right for you is good for you, even though it might not be right for someone else. And, and this type of teaching denies the demanding justice of a holy God. It, it makes it increasingly more difficult to share the gospel because until you recognize your great need, you will not look for a savior. And so think about it. If mankind is naturally good, then he can, through religion and through good works, be acceptable to God. If mankind is naturally good, he just needs some religious rituals as a supplement to his good behavior. But I said this last week. You don't need a righteousness supplement. We need a righteousness replacement. Amen? Amen. Isaiah 64, 6, God reminds us in that verse that in comparison to the perfection that he requires, all of our works are as filthy rags. And the idea there in the Hebrew is the idea of menstrual rags. And that had particular meaning to a Jewish people who believed that any type of bleeding would make you unclean. So think about it. You, on your best day... <laughs> You still fall short of God's perfect requirement. You, on your best day, you are still unclean. Again, if mankind is seen as inherently good, then the problem will always be with the systems and the structures rather than the individual. That was the thinking of Karl Marx, that mankind is naturally good, and so there are systems and structures that are evil and oppressive, and we need to tear down those systems and structures in order to liberate the individual. Again, the thinking is if the individual is freed from oppressive power structures because man is inherently good, that will create this utopian society. The start of what we know as critical theory today largely emanates from the ideas of Karl Marx. And critical theory is uh, now pervading our, our universities. It's this approach to social philosophy that focuses on society and culture in an attempt to reveal and critique and challenge all power structures. Again, if man is inherently, inherently good, then the problem must be with the power structures. And my question would be, if mankind is inherently good, then who creates the evil power structures, right? But as this thinking spreads, I want you to understand it is tearing down the biblical foundations of our country. It is right now robbing our culture of the fear of God and where the fear of God is lacking, sin abounds. 
We've come to a place as a nation where culture is encouraging depravity, and it is depravity without remorse. But here's what you need to know. That same kind of thinking has destroyed cultures in the past, and yet it's so ringing so loudly in our nation today. And that's why I believe, now more than ever, in our nation's history, that the church must stand up as the pillar of truth. We need to hold up the word of God, which is the word of truth. We need to rely on the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, because he is the spirit of truth. Now, remember, in the first three chapters of Romans, Paul has addressed this same problem in the Greco-Roman world. It was a, a culture that very much mirrors our culture today. Paul has shown us how wicked it is to worship creation. One of the religions we see on the rise in our culture today is the religion of environmentalism. And hear me, I love nature. I believe we're called to be good stewards of creation that, that God has given to us, but we should never worship creation over the creator, okay? And so when people begin to say, well, we should limit the population to save creation, you're worshiping creation rather than the creator, right? And so Paul also pointed out in, in, in those chapters, he pointed out uh, that mankind makes pleasure a God. And that he does not give God the honor that, that he deserves as our creator and as our sustainer. And then he addressed the, the self-righteous religious spirit that deceives man into thinking that he could ever be good enough on his own to live up to God's glorious standards. Because if mankind is indeed inherently sinful, if we fall short of God's righteous standard, if all of our good works are as filthy rags, then the, the question is how could we ever be made right with God, right? How could we possibly be brought into a relationship with a holy God when, when we are less than holy? And Paul makes the point that the only way that we can be made right with God is by faith. It's not by works. In fact, it can't be by works. Because if we talk about a righteousness that comes through the law, the only way that the law justifies is if you keep it in its entirety. And we already said no one can do that, right? At the end of our text last week, Paul asked the question, do we then overthrow the law by this faith. And he says, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Because really, it is the law that makes us aware of how sinful we are. It's the law that shows us God's perfect standard, and when we see that standard, we realize we fall short. It's the law that ultimately points to salvation that is by faith. That's where we're going to jump into in chapter 4 of the book of Romans. Would you stand with me this morning for the reading of God's word there in Romans chapter 4? We want to honor uh, the word of the Lord in this way. Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, Paul writes, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was, uh, it was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it is living and it's active. We thank you, Lord, that it gives us a clear understanding, Lord, of who you are and who we are. And so I pray in this moment, Holy Spirit, that you would speak through your word, Lord God, that we would approach it today with a reverence, with an awe, We'd also approach it with an expectancy. 
Lord God, believing that you desire to speak to your people, you desire to speak to your church today. And so we give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to encourage you, uh, if you have your note sheet, to pull it out. We're going to jump into the text today. I, I've given you on that note sheet the text and Again, encourage you to highlight things, circle things. If you have a paper Bible in front of you, it's always great because you can highlight and you can circle. Yes, you can write in your Bible. That's okay. Encourage you to do that. Uh, So as you're reading it, these things come to mind. And and so Paul jumps off of this question in verse 31 of chapter 3. Again, the question is, does this idea of justification through faith apart from the law make the law irrelevant? And he answers that question by looking at two examples from the Old Testament. We're going to look at Abraham and King David. Abraham is known as the father of the Jewish faith, and David was the greatest king of Israel, right? He was a man after God's own heart. Now, verse 1 says, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? In other words, what did the physical forefather of the Jews gain? Like, what did he accomplish in the eternal sense? Remember, the covenant that made the Jewish people a special people was made between God and Abraham. And so if he's really uh, the ultimate Jew, so to speak, right, what did he gain and how did he obtain a relationship with God? How was this relationship established? Verse 2, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. In other words, if Abraham was able to live a perfect life, if he never sinned, he could boast about it. If his works made him righteous, if his works justified him before God, then he could say, look at me and and do what I do if you want to get to heaven, right? Listen, if any one of us could live a perfect life and be justified by our works, then we would have something to boast about. But last week we talked about how boasting is not possible because salvation is through faith, amen? And so even Abraham, who's, who's the father of the Jews, He couldn't boast to God or anyone else about living a perfect life. That's not how he received the promises of God. And this whole idea of somehow, think about it, standing before God someday and saying, God, look at what a good job I did, right? It's crazy when you understand the life of faith. Yet there are many who think they'll do just that, that they'll be saved by their works. It's really the basis of every other world religion beside Christianity. And so if Abraham, the father of the faith, wasn't made righteous by the things that he did, then how did he enter into a relationship with God? And I love Paul's response there in verse 3. He says this, for what does the scripture say? I love that. There's a question on the table, right? And, And Paul says, well, what does the word of God say about this? I wish that we would do that more often, right? As the people of God, as all these questions come to us, we ought to say, well, what does the word of God say about that? Because hear me, if you don't believe that the scriptures are inspired by God, I don't know why you come to church, first of all, right? I, I don't know why you would bother reading the Bible if you don't believe that it's inspired by God. Like, why try to learn from this if it's just man's ideas? But if it's inspired, then we have to ask the question constantly, what does it teach us? What does it teach us, right? How did Abraham become a friend of God? What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Three words in that verse you should circle, highlight, underline. Believed, counted, righteous. Believed, counted, righteous. Paul is quoting directly from Genesis 15, 6. Now, generally, the Jewish teachers of that day believed that Abraham was justified by his works. They believed that he was justified by by keeping the law. Some of the ancient uh, passages written by the rabbis say this, we find that Abraham, our father, had performed the whole law before it was given. In other words, they argued that Abraham kept the law perfectly before he even had the law. It was almost like he knew intuitively what he was supposed to do, and he did it all, and he did it all perfectly. And so Paul is searching the scriptures to answer this question. Because he too, at one time, had been trying to please God by keeping the law But then he met Jesus. And at that point, he goes back over the same scriptures that he probably read thousands of times, right? And he discovers this truth that he's sharing in Romans because he sees that scripture never says that Abraham obeyed the law and was therefore righteous. On the other hand, it teaches us that it was believing God, through believing God, that he was counted as righteous. Again, he's quoting from Genesis 15, 6. And in that passage, if you read Genesis chapter 15, God is speaking to Abraham about being the father of a nation. He told Abraham that he would have a son in his old age, even though 
His wife, Sarah, had been barren her whole life. Think about that. She'd been barren her whole life, and and now she's old, and now it's harder for her to get pregnant, right? And and God is saying, there's a promise I'm making to you, Abraham. And he brings him outside. He says, look up at the stars. Now, uh, I'm sure you could see the stars much clearer out in the desert than you can in Rockland County, right? But he could see all the stars in the sky. And he tells him, your descendants will be like the stars that you see. And at that point, Abraham's about 90 years old. His wife's about 80 years old, but he believed the promise. Now hear me, when we talk about belief, it's more than just acknowledging that something is true because James tells us that the demons believe, right? Even the demons believe and they shudder, right? This belief that he talks about is really to place your trust in or to entrust yourself to what you have faith in. In fact, the Hebrew verb form of that word believe, it means to be certain, It means to be certain. It's this idea of of leaning on something with your whole weight. Like you can lean on it and you can put your weight on it and it's not going to fail you. It's interesting that that Proverbs tells us, Pastor Edwin quoted the verse already, Proverbs tells us what not to lean on, right? Lean not on your own understanding. Don't put your weight on, on your own understanding. But what can you lean on today? That's the question today. Can you lean on God? Can you lean on your faith? And so Abraham believed the promise of God, and he believed it with certainty, and And so righteousness or right standing was credited to his account. Did Abraham live perfectly? Absolutely not. (laughs) Just read through Genesis, right? You'll see his failures as well. But God counted him righteous simply because he believed the vision that God gave to him. Now, what does that tell us about what is required to enter into a relationship with God today? I mean, did God change the way he operates after Jesus? No, it's still the same today, that the sinner who believes is still in the same way made righteous by faith alone. That was one of the great truths of the Reformation. It was sola fide, right? Salvation is by by faith alone. It's faith plus nothing. Paul doesn't say that Abraham was made righteous in everything he did, but rather that God accounted Abraham as righteous. And so our justification before God is not God making us perfectly righteous, and yet at the same time, he counts us as perfectly righteous. And it is after we are counted righteous that God begins to shape us and make us truly righteous. You see, so many people have it backward. They think they, they need to get their act together, right? Maybe you've invited somebody to church and like, I can't go in there. The place would fall down on me, right? I gotta get my life together first, right? And then maybe, then I can show up at church. Listen, you can never get your act together on your own, <laughs> right? And, and so you come to Jesus by faith. You come believing what he did for you on the cross. And because of that faith, righteousness is counted. The Greek word is the word logizomai, right? And it means this, to put on one's account. To put on one's account. That's what God did. He put righteousness on Abraham's account. He credited it to him. And so Abraham possessed that righteousness in the same way that someone would possess a sum of money if it was put in their bank account, right? Like you sell me money today if you want to, right? I possess that money, right? It's credited to my account. Again, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous. Verse four, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And so again, if Abraham was perfect and did everything God required him to do, then God would owe him salvation. Listen, if you were perfect, and did everything God required you to do, and we already said if you start today, it's already too late, right? If you did live your life perfectly, God would owe you salvation. And and if that were the case, then there would be no need for Paul to state that Abraham believed God and therefore was counted righteous. Again, just read through the book of Genesis, you'll see Abraham was not perfect, and yet he believed that God justifies the ungodly. It was that belief, it was that faith that allowed him to be counted as righteous. Listen, if you go to work and you put in the hours and you punch the clock, when you receive that paycheck, right, that paycheck is not a gift, okay? It's what you're owed, it's what's due to you, right? And so when we talk about a system of works, what it really does is it seeks to put God in, in, in our debt. It makes us believe that God owes us his favor because of our good behavior, right? Have you ever thought that way? Have you ever, maybe you don't want to admit it, have you ever heard someone speak that way? I I did everything right. 
and God didn't come through. Well, first of all, let's be clear. I'm sure you didn't do everything, right? <laughs> like, let's be honest, right? But also understand that's works mentality. God, God owes me blessing because of my good works. God owes me salvation because of my good works. But the idea of grace, hear me, it stands totally opposed to the principle of works. Because grace has to do with, if you're following in the note sheet, it has to do with receiving a free gift of God. Receiving the free gift of God. While work says this, I've earned my merit with God. And so it is by faith that we entrust ourselves to God to make us right. And if you're doing that, I just want to say this morning, you are right with God. If you're doing that today, you can be certain that God will make you righteous. And just like Abraham, you're probably here today and you're not perfect, but God has accepted the substitute of Jesus. Again, he bore the wrath of your sins. And so we entrust our soul to God. We trust his work to save us and not our own good deeds. Hear me today, righteousness can never be accounted to someone who approaches God on the principle of works, and yet it is given freely to anyone who believes on the one who justifies the ungodly. That's, that's the good news of the gospel today, right? That God justifies the ungodly. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, God can justify the ungodly. Now hear me, because I need to make this distinction this morning. Okay, it's not that God is happy with our ungodly condition. Okay, you understand that? It's not that he's happy with our ungodly condition. And so we're, we're not justified because of our ungodliness, but rather we are justified despite our ungodliness. Our faith is counted as righteousness, just as Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness. And, and when we understand God's grace in that way, then we begin to have a desire to live in a way that's pleasing to him. Be, because we'll understand, man, the great sacrifice that he made for us. It's because of that sacrifice that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so hear me today. Don't let the enemy beat you up and discourage you when you stumble and when you fall. Notice I said when you stumble, not if, right? Uh, I love to say it this way, that the mark of a mature believer is that when they stumble and when they fall, they run to Christ, not away from him. Because they realize in that moment that it's the cross of Jesus Christ is exactly what they need. Hear me, if you fail, if you fail, confess it and get back up again confess it and get back up again. Get back up and, and ask the Holy Spirit to give you freedom in that area, but, but at the same time, know this today, you are forgiven. You see, that's the joy and that's the freedom that every believer should walk in every single day of our lives. We should rejoice in the fact that by faith we are made right with God. And because of that, hear me today, we don't need to fear death because of that, we, we know that heaven is waiting for us, amen? Because of that, we should have joy every day. Now, now, in order to make his point, Paul points, first of all, to the passage about Abraham in Genesis, and now he's going to take us to another passage that gives us the same conclusion. He's going to talk about King David's account of justification and forgiveness. Verse 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Now, King David, he knew what it was like to be guilty. He understood the seriousness of his own sin. If David were to be judged by his works alone, then God, as a righteous judge, must condemn him. And, and if salvation were by works, there would be uh, no blessedness that comes from being forgiven because there would be nothing to be forgiven of, right? But this quote from Psalm 32 wouldn't make any sense if salvation came by works. But as soon as David confessed his sins, he was forgiven. In other words, the Lord would no longer count David's sin against him. And, and even though David didn't know about the sacrifice of Jesus that was still yet to come, his sin was paid for by the cross of Jesus. Remember chapter 3, verse 23, Paul tells us that we all sin, right? We all fall short. And because of that fact, there is only one way that you and I can be righteous. Think about it, if Israel's forefather, Abraham, was a sinner, right? If their greatest king, King David, a man after God's own heart, was a sinner, and they were both saved by believing faith that entrusted their salvation to God, then why would this not be the way of salvation for all Jewish people, and for that matter, 
What about the Gentiles as well, right? Verse 9, is this blessing then for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised, right? And so if we're counted as righteous before God because of our faith, if it's not because of circumcision or, or any other ritual that we might put our trust in, then the blessing can be given to the uncircumcised as well. Praise God. In other words, that blessing, that same blessing can come to the Gentiles. Now, going on there in verse 9, we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteous. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. This is such a good point by Paul, right? Was Abraham considered righteous before or after circumcision, right? Like, like if you're believing in circumcision, he's talking to the Jews here, to make you righteous, this is a good question to ask. And we saw it in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham was counted as righteous, but he doesn't receive the covenant sign of circumcision until Genesis chapter 17, which we know was at least 14 years later. Right? So he's declared righteous, and 14 years later, he receives the sign of the covenant. Therefore, his righteousness wasn't based on circumcision, but rather it was based on faith. The father of all those who believe was declared righteous while he was still uncircumcised. That pretty much destroys uh, the argument that the Gentiles must be circumcised before God before they can be declared righteous. You see, the Jews of, of Paul's day, they looked at the significance of circumcision and, and, and they believed it was really an entry point for a life lived under the law of Moses. That's why Paul says in Galatians 5.3 that every man who becomes circumcised is a debtor to keep the whole law. In other words, if that's the direction you're going to go, you've got to keep the whole law, right? If, if you're, you're being circumcised and you're thinking that circumcision saves you, then you've got to keep the whole law. Yet again, Paul uses scripture and he uses basic logic to point out a truth that had been distorted in that time. And the same thing happens today for those who are unwilling to accept the word of God and accept reason. Verse 11 says this, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had, what? By faith, while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believed without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And, and so this phrase, Father Abraham, maybe you sang the song in preschool, right? Father Abraham had many sons, right? Or, or, or our Father Abraham, right? That was one of the ways that the Jews referred to Abraham. They would say, he's our father, our Father Abraham. In fact, they, they took such pride in that that they would not even allow a, a Gentile who was converted to Judaism to use that phrase. Like if a Gentile came and even if he was circumcised and he wants to be a Jew, no, you don't get to use that phrase. He's still not your father. He's, he's our father. Only natural-born Jews could say, our Father. Think about that. Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray, our Father. And so here's what Paul does. He says, through faith, all of us can say, our Father Abraham. Just think about that for a moment. What a shock that must have been to the Jews who read this letter, right? Paul is calling Abraham the father of uncircumcised people. And he's saying, here's the real link to Abraham. It's not circumcision, it's faith. Like, they're so focused on the circumcision of Abraham, but, it, but it's, far, it's far more important to have Abraham's faith than to have his circumcision. Because really, the outward sign of circumcision was simply testifying to what had already happened in the heart. Like, like the heart is changed, right? The heart is changed, and then the sign is given as a testimony to that change. It's similar to what we believe with baptism. We don't see baptism as salvific here, right? In other words, baptism cannot save you. No, you're saved through faith in the work of the cross. There is this, this change in your heart as you trust in and, and you lean on God, right? Uh, rather than your own ability to be good. And baptism simply testifies what has already taken place, right? And what Paul says here is that God intentionally had the sign of circumcision come later on. The sign came after the belief so that the world would know it's not the other way around. And it's still the same today. We come to God by faith. We're, we're saved because we're, we're trusting in and we're leaning on the work of the cross, right? We're, we're, we're putting our full weight on what Jesus accomplished for us. And when we do that, we are justified. We are declared righteous before a holy God. And then we receive the seal or the sign of the new covenant, which is the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, just like circumcision was a seal of the old covenant, the Holy Spirit is, is the sign, okay, of the new covenant. And, and so we're saved by faith, and then we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit produces in us what? Produces the fruit of the Spirit, right? But again, understand that fruit is not what saves us. Just like circumcision didn't make Abraham righteous, but was rather a sign that he was righteous in the same way the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a sign that God has declared us righteous. Are you with me today? And and then he goes on to say this, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come as we prepare to close. So again, Abraham is the father of those with faith, not just those who have the mark of circumcision, right? Because any male can be circumcised. In fact, most males in our Western culture are circumcised simply for health reasons. It has nothing to do with faith. And William Barclay says that the Jewish teachers in Paul's day, they had this saying. They said this, what is written of Abraham is written of his children. What is written of Abraham is written of his children, meaning that all the promises that were given to Abraham extend to his descendants. And Paul says, yes, absolutely. This idea of being justified by faith, it extends to all of Abraham's spiritual descendants. Understand that today. It extends to all who believe. That's what it really means to walk in the footsteps of the faith of Abraham. So, so if there were Jews in the, in the church in Rome who were still trusting in the fact that they had the sign of the covenant, but they weren't walking in the faith of Abraham. They needed to stop, and they they needed to think about where the trust in their lives truly lies. For believers today who think they're born again, but they don't walk in a relationship of faith with God, same way that Abraham did, we need to ask, are we truly walking in the Spirit, or are we just relying on the works of the flesh? I'll say it again, you can go to church every week and you can read your Bible and you can say your prayers, but if you're not walking in the relationship with God that Abraham had, then you don't have the sign of the new covenant, which is that Holy Spirit. And in the same way that that many of the Jews had the outward sign of the covenant but didn't have a, a heart change, there are those in the church that claim to have the Spirit of God without a heart change. But if you're here today and you're living by faith, and you're believing the promise of God. You're you're trusting in the fact that that you've been saved because of Jesus' sacrifice, and you're putting your weight on that, and you're trusting that, then you will have spiritual, spiritual life. The indwelling Holy Spirit will come and begin to circumcise the heart. But here's the deal. You gotta be humble enough to recognize that you could never be good enough on your own. Apart from Jesus, man, we're all doomed. (laughs) Therefore, we got nothing to boast about this morning. And so the text brings some questions to the surface that I want you to write down as we close. And the first one is this. First of all, where is your faith placed? Right now, where is my faith placed? You have to ask yourself, "Am am I trusting in my good works? Or have I truly entrusted myself to God? Do you believe him today? Do you believe his word? If so, then just as Abraham was counted righteous, you are counted righteous today. Just as David was forgiven of his sin, you're forgiven today. Cannot only say that Abraham is your father, but today you can declare that God is your father. See, sometimes we forget what it means to be a Christian, don't we? We get caught up in doing so many things and we think those things are going to make us right before God and we forget it's really all about faith it's about faith in the finished work of the cross it's about faith and resting in what Christ Jesus did for you and so here's the last question I want to ask today are you resting are you resting some of you are taking a nap are you resting <laughs> now, are you resting in the finished work of Jesus and the cross or are you still striving trying to earn salvation on your own See, trust in Christ alone. I want to encourage you this morning. Rest in what Jesus has done. Believe. Be certain today of the righteousness that is yours through the cross. I want to tell you, you can lean on it. You can put your weight on it. Because I can guarantee you this. The cross is not going to fail you. Would you stand with me as we pray? Heavenly Father.
We thank you this morning that righteousness can be credited to our account. Lord God, not because of what we've done. Lord, we recognize today we all fall short. But today we declare our faith and our trust in you. Lord Jesus, we're, we're leaning on. We're trusting in what you've already done for us. Lord, I pray for anyone who's not taken that step. Pray even in this moment that they would just say simply, Lord, I believe. I'm trusting you today. I'm trusting in what you've done for me. I'm not going to lean on my own good works. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. I'm going to, Lord, put my faith in what you've done for me. And we thank you, Lord God, that the moment that we do that, that righteousness is accredited to our account. And we thank you today for the Holy Spirit. We thank you today for that sign, that, that seal of the new covenant that you've made with us. And Lord, we, we worship you. We rejoice in that fact. Father, I pray for your church this week. Lord God, that we would not strive in our own strength, but that we'd rest in the work of the cross and that your Holy Spirit would do something through us that would change us. Lord, do something through us that would get the attention of those around us, not for our glory, but for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together before we leave this place. Let's lift up the name of Jesus.